Hi, this is Paul. Yesterday when I was recording the video that is entitled TLC is Metamodern Contestant Reformation, I was looking for the big book quote that Chad had read on the live stream and Chad graciously included it, uh, probably a fuller quote in the comments section. Now this, this quotation stuck out at me. My first ever interaction with a podcast was with an English podcast coming out of a very prominent church in the UK. I walked by it with Justin Brierley when I was there two years ago. Um, I don't remember. It, it's a it's a very prominent church. I can't remember the, the guy, but they were doing a podcast, and I actually, I was listening to the podcast fairly regularly, and I actually sent an email to them and an email question basically about Santa Claus letters. Because every year, of course, Santa Claus gets a lot of mail. And if you watch an old movie like Miracle of 34th Street, uh, the climax of the movie is when they come and dump all of the mail in the courtroom and there Kris Kringle receives it. And hence, Kris Kringle is Santa Claus and the little girl gets her house and all of those nice things in Miracle 34th Street. And it led me to uh, an image, basically, about God and uh, mail addressed to whatever. Um, you know, there's this, they just made a movie of it, too, something, hi, this is Alice, can you hear me? Something like that, if there's a God. And, and my thesis is that God opens misaddressed mail. And I think this big book quote really nails it. So Chad included it here, and you can see it, and I want to... Um, I want to read it because I think it's a great quote. I don't know if I, if I click on this, will I? No, all right. A quote from the big book. Who then made all this? There's a feeling of awe and wonder, but it was fleeting and soon lost. We, of agnostic temperament, have had, have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God, capital P, power. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach. This is God answering. This is God receiving all of the all of the email and letters and prayers addressed um, to in whatever way, shape, or form. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of all things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. That was the line that grabbed me. We found that God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Now, granted, there are many who seek and seek and feel like they get a closed door. Read C.S. Lewis's um, A Grief Observed. So this isn't magic. This isn't a formula. This isn't, this isn't a science experiment. And the best analogy we have is relating to a person because the person on the other end of the conversation has full control as to how to respond and what to do. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. That's the AA big book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual things deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. At the start, this was all we needed to commence spiritual growth. Again, this is not the ending, this is the beginning. To affect our first conscious um, relation with God as we understood him. Afterwards, we found ourselves accepting many things, which then seemed entirely out of reach. That was growth. But if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, and am I even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than myself? 
as soon as and I've noticed many times, I have to keep, I've got a Randall's conversation at the top of the hour. I, I many times I've noticed that part of what comes along in the Enlightenment package is this prejudice that humanity is at the top of the hierarchy. This is a point of humility where you say, maybe I'm not. I'm willing to try. And in fact, people who are really working the program are have a degree of desperation and earnestness that they are using to seek. And again, I believe that this is true. Now, some of you who are critical and suspicious might for a moment say, well, you've sort of implanted an element of God into this little formula, haven't you? Oh, yes, indeed they have. They very much have. And what they've implanted in there is very much what you get from Jesus and what you get from the Bible. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. Um, God is not so far off that the, the, the sermon at Mars Hill, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. All of this is available to you. That is a very strong, implicit message throughout the Bible. It's in the Old Testament as well. Haman and him reaching out to the God of Israel for healing from leprosy. It's all in there. And it's, it's come through in the big book. Do I now believe and am willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, he emphatically assured him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven upon us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderful, effective spiritual structure can be built. Now again, this is not magic. It doesn't mean that God is going to answer. Now, it also doesn't mean that if you feel God hasn't answered, he isn't answering. Both of those things are, um, you have to examine both of those things. Because many people will say, I cried out and God didn't answer. Okay, maybe he didn't. Maybe you didn't feel like he answered. Again, the best analogy we have this is human relationships. Uh, you tried to get my attention. I didn't give you the answer that you desired. Um, all sorts of ways you can, you tried to get your mother's attention, you didn't get what you desired, etc., etc., etc. That was great news for us because in terms of AA, this is what they stumbled into. This is what they discovered. This is what they found. For we had, for we had assured, we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe. This is so true of this given moment. And there's a question that Brendan Dempsey asked me that, that actually gets at this. Maybe I should just append a clip to that if I have time to do that. It also reminds me, it also reminds me of this video um, where Alex O'Connor is on with the trigonometry guys. And Alex O'Connor is effectively arguing the Christian position. And in fact, elephant that is Glenn Scrivener makes a reaction video to that video where Glenn Scrivener pretty much goes through at each point. Now, he doesn't quite cover the expressive individualism, the what Robert Bella called the Sheilaism of Constantine um, Kissin in that video. But it's very interesting how more and more people are basically saying, it's obvious to us we need religion. It's obvious to us we need God. It's obvious to us that all of this is important, but can we really believe it? This was great news for us, for we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe. When people presented us with spiritual approaches, how frequently did we all say, I wish I had what that man has. I'm sure it would work if I could only believe what he believes. Again, this is what we are hearing all the time today. We're hearing it from big brain skeptics, from all sorts of people. But I cannot accept as surely true as the many articles of faith, which are so plain to him. So it was comforting to learn that we could commence at a simpler level. And I think if I had had this quote 
memorized or on the tip of my tongue, I probably could have given this answer to Brendan. So maybe I'll drop this my that little portion of my conversation with Brendan at the end of this because I think it's an outstanding quote and I think it works and I think it validates what Jesus says, ask, knock, seek. But again, it's not magic. He may hold you off. He may play hard to get. He may decide he is going to string you along. He may do to you what he did to Mother Teresa, which is the dark night of the soul in a very long way. He may do to you what he did to C.S. Lewis. Again, those of you who imagine, part of what's happened is that we've been contaminated with sort of a, a new age fairy god that says that God is always available, God is always happy, clappy, God is always this doting grandfather that C.S. Lewis writes about in Mere Christianity. No, he is not. You don't play chicken with God. You don't play games with God. You definitely do not try to manipulate with God. Now, at the beginning, he might allow some of that to happen just to because he wants to have a conversation with you. Well, doesn't he want to have a conversation with everyone? That's a really tricky question. Now, obviously, you have the Timothy quote that God wants everyone to seek him and come to salvation. That we know. But we also know that God is cagey and he understands that we are complex. And so he deals with us, we have to assume, in the best way for existence and reality. So I would say read not only seek and you'll find knock and the door should be open, but also read Luke 18, the parable of the persistent widow, where Jesus basically makes the claim there's a judge and there's a widow. And of course, there's cultural layers to this. So this is an old, um, Kenneth Bailey made the point that during the, the civil war in Lebanon, um, old women could do what young men could never do. Why? Because old women could go up to various combatants and claim justice, and people would tolerate it from the old women because they were like grandmas. They were the they had the power of the shadow matriarchy, and they wielded it. But the point of Luke 18 is don't stop knocking. Bloody your knuckles on the door of God and and demand that God give you what you need. Now, God will give you what you need. It might not be what you want. But I think this quote is absolutely great, and maybe I'll append that other thing. I've got 15 minutes. I probably have enough time. So leave a comment. Thanks for watching. But but one of the questions I would have, too, though, for you is that while you can say to that congregant, he is risen, and for them it lands, you know, in a kind of more, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what you want to say, a historical they have a very or physical... vivid narrative about it. Sure. And that narrative includes most of the elements that are traditional. That's yeah. pretty much where Lewis goes with respect to his ascension question in his book yeah. Miracles. But yeah. But now on. if you if if for that, let's say you also have in your congregation a Silicon Valley, you know, tycoon who, you know, is wrestling with all this stuff or whatever. If if you or if he were to say in his mind, or you know, when he thinks, when he speaks the word and he says he is risen, and for him that means something like these profound archetypal patterns of birth and decay that are that you know constitute the nature of reality are at work in in the the the, the symbol of Jesus in such a way that gives us hope and encouragement uh you know yada 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 something largely metaphorical right is that to your mind like not enough in some kind of way, or is it, is it like a, it, it doesn't, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I know exactly what yeah. you mean. Like, is there, is there for people who do find some value in, in, in uh, relating to the language, the image, the symbols, the, the whole Christian infrastructure for lack of a better term, but, but find a particular value in reading that through the lens of metaphor um, what, I don't know, I guess the question would be something like what is missing there or like what, what's, what's not enough in that or, or yeah. There's a tax for having a big IQ and a lot of education. Then there it is in some ways, they're going to have to, they're going to have to do a little bit more work in, because I, I think about, so I think about the eschaton, I think about the age to come. And I think about issues like purgatory. Purgatory is such an interesting question because it's like, okay, 
you know, I, 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 I bury with great praise. I try to bury honestly, but I, 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 I'm not about to, I'm not about to kneecap the grieving. Um, I, I bury, I bury saints and sinners. And when I think about, so Jordan Peterson, again, in, in these little videos that he has with this very earnest Roman Catholic trying to do a sales job, um, <laughs> he sort of pushes Peterson to sort of bottom line Peterson's idea of his soteriology. And mm. You know, I I don't know what the resurrection is going to look like. I really don't. I've thought about this at a variety of angles. In fact, conversation I had with Neil Plantinga, who was, hmm. you know, was, was a professor of mine at Calvin Seminary. and he Related to, write... to Alvin? Yeah, he's Alvin's younger brother. Oh, interesting. He's a theologian. Okay. He's He's got a few books out there. But he really, last time I, I had any kind of conversation with him, I said, what are, you, what are you working on, Neil? He's like, well, I really want to write some books. And this is these are some of the areas he wants to write about. I, I think he's probably such a perfectionist that the books don't come out because he is such a crafter of words. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I really hope he gets something done because, you know, there, there's a whole range of questions with respect to eschatology, which is the most unfinished, well, you know, locus of the church. Um, there's a whole range about okay, what 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 does the what is the resurrection gonna look like and how 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 will this work and what does this mean? And this person that I put in the ground that I was their pastor and I I know their I know their sins, I know their unfinished business, I know all kinds of things about them, and how how how, how then are they integrated into and blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. My questions my questions go on forever with respect to this. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I know that this person has a fairly low resolution picture of a reunion with beloved family and friends mm -hmm. and no more crying and no more tears and no more broken deaths. That's the limit of their frame. Happy are they? Sure. Now, the, the people like me that have all of these thoughts and questions and, you know, I can, because the, 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 the beyond modernity and post-modernity, just, you know, combinatorial explosiveness with respect to issues that arise. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But well, there's the tax on your IQ and your education. Now you got to carry that stuff around too and still figure it out in a way that I could say with Karl Barth, you know, um, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible told, tells me so. Mm -hmm. And so I think the challenge for those with big IQs and big educations and walls full of books is in fact to create a witness and, and to lead institutions that actually mm. scale for people. Yeah. And now in a pluralistic world, don't just scale this way within mm. an evil village, but scale this way into an interconnected cosmopolitan world. Yeah. Because, you know, part of the problem that I see is certain answers which are at hand also fall apart upon further scaling. Sure. And so yeah. even, you know, it, it remains a journey for all of us. And, um, and and I, I believe that, you know, in the final day when we are called to account for what we've done with what we've been given, um, you know, these these questions will come sure. will come to the podium as well. Mm -hmm. And so because if if the answers I give cut the legs out from under the poor mm -hmm. and their ability to in whatever difficult circumstance they have, believe that Jesus has them well in his hand, mm -hmm. I will be called to account for that too. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I, I I think the I think the person who's been blessed with all sorts of smarts and education and opportunity, they just like the just just like the person living out on the sidewalk after here out here has to work out their salvation in fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. And they just got different challenges. Yeah. And I think God understands. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think you're very right about like the additional tax that comes from that. But I also, 
I don't know. Maybe there's something about uh I'm not sure exactly why I lean in more to the the gains that also come from this. I guess because I've 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 these are the things I've grappled with, so I, I do see them in the in the whole scheme of things as being net gains rather than net losses, which I tend to view through the lens of development or growth or mature maturity. You know, Paul says right in the in well, you could probably tell me where he says it, but uh, you know you, that you've been drinking sort of children's food before this, but now I'm you know it's time for and there's there's an element even in the tradition that there's sort of different grades gradations of 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 these ways of thinking and i i think of something like puberty right where man there was yeah it was really lovely to be you know carefree and kind of the the child the the childhood innocence that like uh you know dylan thomas talks about in that poem fern hill of just you know time held me you know green and dying and all that stuff like there's a wonderful innocence to all that but then there's also wonders to gaining maturity and learning about sex and, you know, and, and relationships and all of that, that would be developmentally inappropriate for younger times. But then that time comes and man, puberty sucks, but you get on the other end of it. And it's like, there's also a lot of gains there. Yeah. And I think that there's a way of conceiving of these, whether they're deconstructions or collapses, but they're transformations. Okay. And, um, and that, yes, you lose something, but you also gain something. Um, and, and I also think that just as for that kid, like the, the kid isn't ready for, and doesn't need to be engaging with the stuff of adults at that time. That's not, that's not appropriate. Uh, we can have different ways of languaging and articulating to different folks in different, uh, modes of life and, and all of that so that we don't have to always be using the same way of understanding these things. Uh, to different people in the same in a in a way analogous to how people transform across the lifespan um because i just want to yeah i i don't want to give the impression that like there needs to be one message fits all and you know we should we should be uh burdening you know a, a grieving widow with questions of you know eschatology or something like that like that's that's not the point but i do think that uh as people are acquiring i don't know more context that they have to integrate from their experience with these older ways of making sense of, in this case, the, the, the Christian tradition, that whatever church we have that scales needs to be able to fit them in, especially those folks I was talking about earlier, who a lot of which are are, are, are crippled by the meaning crisis and are, are most in the situation where uh, there needs to be a language for them too. And that is seemingly going to have to integrate uh, those modern and postmodern things. And um, yeah, I think that uh, it might not be the easiest route. And <laughs> this is a story I just gave, you know, can attest to it's, it can be very, very difficult. Um, but um, yeah, I think that there's also something that I'd like to feel like is comes from that. It's, it's a, a turmoil that can ultimately deepen faith, hopefully. Right. It doesn't yeah, have to. No, I agree. Too. I yeah. agree completely. Yeah. It's, it's just also there with the warning of, you know, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven for a camel get to, you know, through the eye of yeah. the needle. And it's like there's rich in various different ways. And sure. in, in Luke's sermon on the plane, you know, you not only have blessed are the poor, but you have woe to the rich. And so <laughs> even though there's there's clearly uh, I, I, I'm by no means telling people they should be stupid. God has given you intelligence and access and possibility, and you are very much supposed to, in fact, Christ demands that you use these things and pursue the kingdom with all of that you have. Mm. But understand that there's also, um, there's a challenge there Yeah. that, um, and you know, blessed are you little flock for it's God's good, you know, favor to give you his kingdom. And, mm -hmm. and so you find that theme, not only in the gospels, but, you know, obviously in the Psalms and in the prophets that, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, to the, you know, it's good to be king, but eh, kings, if you're king, you're going to be judged at a higher standard. Sure. And so for those of us who are thinky talky and, and good with words and can read books well and have access to YouTube channels and have a degree of visibility, um, I think the, I think the Bible's pretty clear will be, um, you know, you know, aspire, it's, you know, aspire to be teachers, but remember <laughs> teachers are judged mm -hmm. more rigorously and so that's that's yeah. i think 
Well, uh, and yeah, we and to see. throw to throw Kierkegaard back into the mix, you know, he talks about uh, a second immediacy, right? That you go from immediacy to reflection, but then the, the the religiosity through through Christianity that can be attained is a second immediacy. Or of course, Paul Ricoeur, I think, famously talked about second naivete, which I do think when yeah. I first was discovering metamodernism, uh, that was a big part of that conversation that really stood out to me because I think that that's that's a big element to it. How do we bring back the simple? How do we yep. bring back, you know, uh, after all this overwrought, overthinking, meta-reflection, yep. how can we land somewhere just pure, simple yep. again? And yep. um, I think that, that that is essential. So, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. That's probably a good place to end. The, the catchphrase I say people, I say go to church. And what I mean by that is in some ways, it's you have to engage in the human relationships around you. That's like the best way to go about that. You know, you have you have relationship, you have a family, you have some kind of community around you, and so that's the the, the best place to go because, in some ways, that's the place that will have this procedural aspect to it that will will ground the other stuff. You know, it's like if you have to. If you have to, you know, to help your kids with their homework or you have to do this this kind of really grounded stuff that has nothing that's very little to do with the, the ideology, you you get engaged in other other people's lives, then it it binds you in a different way, right? It binds you. And then like my you know, my father would um, he was going to church and I wasn't really living with him, but he was going to church and he would like kind of yeah, so those are elements of this conversation. Because I got to go to church. Um, it's being being part of a church is part of Christian discipleship. And in that word discipleship, there's this word discipline, which is it's a discipline to go to church. It's I was what would be so great about actually going to a church is like you start going to a church so that when you do need like to be prayed for when you have something to be prayed for about you have a place to just say that you're dead on right grizz and that is what the church is for to know and be known to love and be loved to have a place to go where people can pray for you where they will welcome you in and this is again part of why I'm, you know, I I I I want churches to have estuaries because it it is I know that it is difficult in many churches for people to in a sense come in and bring their real self. And what I mean by that is have to say what's on their mind. Or you can't wrestle with them. It's like, you know, so Plato, you know, as John reminds us, is broad, so he's a wrestler. You can't wrestle over a screen. So maybe if it's paintball for Jesus, maybe it should be wrestling with Plato. Um, because, and, and in church, in a real space, now often it doesn't happen. I understand that. But at least there's a chance to actually have a relationship with grit. And that's part of why churches are local. They're relational, they're face-to-face, -face, they're in real life. That about why would young people want to go uh, to church? And I, I feel like I want to have some, some kind of dynamic message or something that if they do find some reason to come, you know, I'm, I'm trying to fish, so I'm throwing bait and I'm trying to hook somebody. It's what Paul is doing too. It's he said about being evangelical, it's evangelism of some sort. Well, fishers of men is the uh, yes is the promise. Yes, yes, correct. It's possessed. We did go to church today. I took communion. I I don't go to church to think or to rationalize God. I go to church to worship Him. Right. And, and that's, I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm very happy with that. And afterwards, during coffee hour, we can all argue about the God of our understanding, right? Yeah. But I think you're right. I think that the wild twin 
I mean, I the thing that led to my my sort of dawning to consciousness of Christianity it was a 101 day vigil that I did in a forest. And I went into the forest. You don't have to go crazy. Yeah. You actually have to go, you have to, you have to humble yourself and be, and, and do it right here, right now, right? Get up. You like, I like how uh, Father Spemann talks about it for the life of the world. He says, it starts when you get up and get ready and you walk or you go to church you start these that's those are simple i get up i brush my teeth i take a shower mm -hmm. i put on clothes i go the things of life and we're ascending up into heaven you're 